I love servers. It initially began when my parents bought me for Christmas this little guy, a HP microserver from 2014. It was a perfect little home NAS, that or Katash storage, for me and my dad to use. I had the opportunity of running my own services like... Hey David, I heard you can make me a website. Could you do that for me? Yeah, sure, I can use my server too. Hey David, you think you can make a Minecraft server for me and my friends to play on? Oh yeah, totally, let me do this. You think you can make a website for my business? Oh no, my website stopped working. You What's think you can make a website Get it set up for yourself. <laughs> yeah, I'll get right to it. The server has held a very special place in my heart and has been running every single day since about 2014. And since it works perfectly, there's no need to replace it yet. When I first got my Raspberry Pi, I felt stuck. I lived under the presumption that because of the small and weak hardware, it couldn't get anything done more than a simple project. And to be fair, that's what the main selling point of the Raspberry Pi was. My 3D printer is controlled by a Raspberry Pi, running a software called Octoprint. And with a webcam plugged in, I ran a private YouTube livestream for a few years and then developed my own website with the Raspberry Pi as a backend for me and my friends to see what I was printing. I even used it as a home entertainment system running Libre Alec, which for the untrained eye is the operating system that runs Kodi, a very well known media player. And with that Pi, I watched two of my favourite shows of all time, The X-Files and Fringe, where the files were kept on my NAS. This brings me on to an important topic that I want to discuss. Your Raspberry Pi doesn't need to be your only server. They're a perfect companion for a more resource intensive workload, such as a Plex media server, which would need to use more powerful resources, more than the integrated GPU in the Raspberry Pi could ever output. But don't get me wrong, you can still use a Pi as your own NAS. You can use a file system such as BTRFS, and you can use a single disk or a RAID level which doesn't have any parity calculations, and performance should actually be pretty decent. The charm behind Raspberry Pis is that you can run many of them together, either in a cluster using an orchestrator like Kubernetes, or just running them separately doing their own task. I've upgraded my home infrastructure in a lot of different ways, where apart from moving house and country a lot of times, I initially started with my microserver, then moved on to an enterprise HP server, and then moved on to my current enterprise Dell server, where initially, I clustered them all together, but now I just run my Dell server by itself with a bunch of extra hardware, which I plan on making a video about in the future. <laughs> now with the flexing out the way, there is one very important thing you need to consider about resorting to using servers like these, and that is the power draw. My Dell server at average load uses about 180 watts, and that might not sound like a lot, but that is only 20% of the true capacity that my server could consume. So obviously, if I start running more workloads, that power draw could increase massively. Whereas, my microserver consumes around 80 watts, which is pretty decent. But wait till you hear about how much a Raspberry Pi consumes. You use USB to power the Raspberry Pi. So in the most resource intensive workload that you could throw out a Pi like this, in my testing, the maximum power draw that the Pi could do is about 15 watts from the wall, which is way lower compared to my Intel-based servers. That plays into how efficient ARM-based devices actually are. We can also see this with Apple's Apple Silicon-based MacBooks, such as this very MacBook with my script. And this is the M2 model, and I used this at school in the UK, and I am so impressed with the performance where I can get around 16 hours of battery life, and it is all based on the ARM architecture. And I should add, if you saw my XPS 13 review, <laughs> this is way better than that XPS 13. Before I continue though, there are different versions of the Raspberry Pi. The first ever Pi released was the Model B from 2012, rocking a Broadcom chip and 256 megabytes of RAM which was an absolutely amazing proof of concept, don't get me wrong, but it was later followed by the Model A, B+, Pi 2, Pi 3 Model B, Model B+, and now the Raspberry Pi 4. There are also smaller factor models for a Raspberry Pi, such as the Raspberry Pi Zero, which is pretty small, 
and then an even smaller version called the Raspberry Pi Pico. And the best use case that I could say for these is absolutely specialized embedded workflows. Depending on what you want to do, you can get your way around using a Raspberry Pi free. But that is only if you're not too reliant on the internet. And what I mean by that is that the Ethernet port, even though it says that it is gigabit, only runs at around 300 megabits per second. And that is because internally it is connected via a USB 2.0 bridge. And that is much slower compared to gigabit. And that comes to Wi-Fi as well, which is again, much slower than a Wi-Fi 5 connection. But for a lower price tag, you get yourself a 1.4 gigahertz CPU and four gigabytes of RAM, meaning that you could run your first ever Home Assistant instance for home automation, which is what I did before I switched to a Pi 4. However, the Pi 4 is where it's at, with a 1.5 GHz CPU, which you could even overclock to around 1.7, up to 8 gigabytes of memory, two USB 3.0 ports and two USB 2.0 ports, a full gigabit Ethernet, a Wi-Fi 5 capable Wi-Fi adapter, you get yourself some pretty decent hardware. And it's not the latest Intel Core i9 or Ryzen 9, but the hardware performs much better than you'd think. I bought my Raspberry Pi 4 as part of a kit bundle, which means I had everything I'd need to get it running. It worked great with what I wanted to do. And I thought about some projects I could do, and I decided to try first of all running Jeff Gearling's Internet Pi repository, which basically tracks my internet connection speed which proved pretty useful in my PFSense video. And in that same Pi throughout the coming months, aside from my Kubernetes cluster on my Intel-based server, I also tried running my own Docker images and some other images to try and make that Pi use up its resources. And I wasn't ever really able to max out its resources and everything I put on it worked just fine. During the hunt for my university choices, me and my parents visited Cambridge. And apart from replacing the hoodie I got 10 years ago with a brand new one which would fit me, I made sure I got to visit the official Raspberry Pi store. And it was an absolute amazing experience, looking at all these devices that initially I'd expect around two weeks to arrive from AliExpress, well I'm seeing them right there in front of my eyes, and I could just pick them out and pay for them. And I even bought myself a Raspberry Pi t-shirt, nice. From camera modules to Zigbee accessories, to prototype pies on the checkout table, to actual pies you can buy, I found everything I needed. Because they were all in stock. There, I bought a couple of things and also online for an upcoming project I want to do in my UK boarding room, which I'm going to make a video about very soon. But I also bought what I think is the best bang for the buck Raspberry Pi that could ever exist. With all this praise and positive experience, that not only I have discovered, but also people on the internet, how does a Pi hold up in 2023? Well, everything that I've said until this video you can do, but let me tell you a few more things. You could run a web server, running your website or a blog secured through Cloudflare. You could run a Minecraft server for you and your friends, a bot of some sorts, such as for Discord, basic machine learning for the built-in camera module, or a music player. And the list goes endless. All of these play a very good role in your home infrastructure, and you can even run many of them in the same device. You don't need multiple Pis to do what I said. And you will see that they all work without a single problem. So what I'm trying to say is that people such as myself underestimate the true potential of a Raspberry Pi. I can pretty much guarantee a smooth experience setting up your beginner home lab, trying out a new experiment, or trying to run a home automation system, everything would run absolutely perfectly. And if you want to try something and you think a Pi is not adequate, just buy an x86 server too and try and run them together. You can see that you can outsource a lot of things to a Raspberry Pi and through time, you might not even need that x86 server anymore. The one thing I would recommend though is that if you want to run a Pi long term and you've already had your experimentation stage over, is that you shouldn't rely on the SD card. And I'm going to tell you why. That SD card it's not made to first of all run an operating system and then run constant I.O. operations such as reading and writing. That is why I recommend you buy yourself an external SSD for the operating system to run because these SD cards, even though they seem like they work perfectly, they're going to die at some point and it will be quite devastating to lose all your data. And for example, I haven't upgraded to an SSD yet, but I'm planning on doing it, but hopefully my Pi will survive until then.
I recommend you stay away from shops like AliExpress or even shipping from China if you want to get yourself the best valuable Raspberry Pi with your money. This is because not every single Raspberry Pi is made in China or Japan. The primary factory is actually at Sony in Wales. So that means you'd be better off for us Europeans, for example, or me living in the UK, buying it directly from a local shop. Finally, the moment you've all been waiting for. What is the most valuable Raspberry Pi, in my opinion, in 2023? It is the Raspberry Pi 4 with the 4GB option. You might be thinking, why shouldn't I get the 8GB option? And I'm going to use my Home Assistant server as an example. With all my workloads, all the transcoding with my cameras, all my home automations, I'm only using half the 4GB memory. Obviously, if you have the money, you should go for the 8GB option for long-term purposes. If you're on a budget and want your own home server, just go ahead and buy the 4GB option. Because in the UK, it's around £55 at the Raspberry Pi store, or even cheaper actually. And if you want to buy it online, it's only about five to ten pounds cheaper and you can convert that to your own currency or look it up at your own shop. The one thing I would say is to watch out for the stock. I'm not sure it's really that relevant anymore because the chip shortage does appear to calm down. But there are cases where even in the UK, there isn't a lot of stock. I'm saying the price in this video based on the only website that has stock and the other websites will get stock in around November. And that also applies to shops like in Spain where there's only one which has pies in stock and that one has a tiny bit of a higher price. So I recommend you spend your time researching for the best place to try and find a pie and make sure you don't pay too much for what it's truly worth. Thank you for watching this video. I hope I've made you reconsider your over-engineering and self-explanation of why you need a really powerful server. Ask yourself this, what am I actually going to run on my server? Has someone already done it on a Pi? How does it run? Does it work instead? <laughs> well, perfect. Just buy a Pi.